I'm Pamela Fox, and this is Portrait of a Python Program. I like to teach Python. I've taught Python to thousands of UC Berkeley students in this class called CS61A, but I've also taught it to small groups, adult learners, high schoolers. Hopefully one day I'll teach it to my little daughters. And I like to give Python learners, which includes myself, always learning, multiple ways to understand a Python program. Let's begin here. This is a Parsons problem, a popular technique in the CS education community to let students learn how to program. A Parsons problem guides students to constructing the expert solution. And it's actually been shown to be just as helpful to learn coding as writing code from scratch. Now in this particular problem, it's asking me to write a function that calculates the total number of paths from the top left corner of a square grid to the bottom right corner. And it has this beautiful ASCII diagrams that shows me what it's talking about, as well as some doc tests that show the expected answers for various inputs. How might I solve it? I can start by dragging in these blocks and then filling in the blanks. If I had no idea, maybe I would just start by dragging in this return one, because I know that it says paths one one returns one. So at least I'll get that right. Let me try running the tests. And we see that one of three tests pass. Of course, those other two tests failed. Let's fix this up. If I remember back to my CS class about recursion, I can break this problem down into a base case and a recursive case. So the base case is going to you know, return one, and then the recursive case is going to break down the problem into smaller parts. So I've dragged over these blocks to look like a recursive function with a base case and a recursive case, and now I'm gonna fill these in. Um, so for the base case, you know, this is usually when the input has become very small. So I might say, try something like, you know, width equals zero or height equals zero. And then for the recursive case, I need to break down this problem somehow. I see it's got two calls to paths. Um, so what I could do is, you know, break down the first call by subtracting one from width, but passing in the same height and breaking down the second call by uh, passing in the same width and then subtracting one from height. Okay, well, let's try that out. This time, none of the tests pass, but we do actually see kind of a pattern. So expected one got two, expected two got six, expected six got 20. So it's just getting too high of a value. And it, you see here, it got six when we expected six for the next one up. Probably my base case isn't quite right. So I'm gonna change this to width equals one or height equals one so that it doesn't go down to that zero case and it stops here. And I'm gonna assume I don't have inputs of zero. And here we go, three out of three tests pass. So that was a faded Parsons problem and it's a way that we used in the Berkeley class to scaffold problems for our Python learners. Of course, just because my test passed, it doesn't mean that I understand exactly how this recursive code is working. One thing that I find really helpful is to draw out the tree of recursive calls that happen. So of course, being the good little programmer I am, I wrote my own tool to do it. This is recursionvisualizer.com and it can visualize recursive Python functions. So here we've got the paths function, we've got the function call, we click visualize and it shows us the entire tree of calls here. But what's really helpful is to use this slider here and go all the way back to the beginning. And then we can just go step by step and visualize how this call graph builds up. So it calls paths two, three, which calls paths one, three, and that returns one because that's a base case. And you can think about that grid, like if you've got you know, width of one, height of three, there's only one way to go from the start to the end, it's just straight down. And then we keep going like that till we get to these base cases. And then you know, once we return from two base cases, then we can sum them up and send that return value up. So now you're sending up two, and now we can sum up one and two, send back three, then we do the, you know, the other recursive call and it's going to do a similar tree of calls here and sends back another three and then it adds three plus three to get six. I find this incredibly useful, especially for complicated recursion problems. Uh, I once drew out a path that had like 60 nodes on it and I did that on a whiteboard. Now I can use this program to do it for me to help me really wrap my head around how these recursive approaches work. Now, you might be saying, hey, why am I even writing this kind of recursive code in Python? 
There's no tail call optimization in Python. I'll blow the stack. Okay, true. So let's look at a way of using a dynamic programming technique to solve the same problem. Here we are in Python Tutor looking at the same function with a very different approach. So this is an approach that is not using any recursive calls, but it is instead building up this grid nested list here that has uh, kind of sub computations and adds up those sub computations. And when we first look at this, it really looks kind of complex, right? There's a lot going on here. So that's why I'm using Python Tutor. Python Tutor is a tool created by Philip Guo from UCSD. And it is incredibly helpful for people learning Python to step through the code. So let's go through this. We start at the beginning and we can see that it knows about this paths function. Then we get to the paths three, three call and that calls the paths function with parameters width of three and height of three. And now this first line is a list comprehension that creates a nested list. And we can see as it builds up this list, so now grid is storing this and I'm actually gonna go ahead and just move these around just to really make it look like the grid that it is since we are calling it grid. This first for loop here for X in range W, it is going through and we can see that it's setting each of the cells in the first column in this nested list to one. And then we do the same with for Y in range height. And we can see that it's now setting each of the cells in the first row to one. And you can think of this as actually, if you you know look back at recursion visualizer, these are basically all these one calls here, right? One, 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 one. We see six calls of one. And that's basically what we've done here. We've just stored it in a very different way. So we're almost like building the recursive call graph, but using a nested list. <laughs> so let's keep going. The next thing that it does is this nested for loop here, which goes through and sets cells to the summation of the kind of the cells behind them. The first thing it does is set this cell here to the summation of this one and this one. And so we get two, and then it's going to set this one to three because it's two plus one. The next time it's going to set this one to three because that's two plus one. And once again, let's look back at this recursion visualizer. Uh, that's similar to what happened here is that we've got, you know, twos and then we've got, we've got threes. And finally it sets this one to six because that's three plus three. And at the very end, it returns the very last cell in this grid, which is going to be that cell that has six in it. And so we get the answer of six. I'm feeling pretty comfortable with the recursive and dynamic versions of this program, but we have a few minutes left. So let's go even deeper. The standard implementation of Python is called C Python. It's written in C. And when it runs Python code, it first turns it into byte code. And the interpreter actually runs the byte code, not the original Python. This byte code is made up of low level operations and it can be optimized by the C Python team. And it's actually changing in every version of C Python. We can use the dis module to see the disassembled bytecode. I made disthis.com, which is one of my favorite domain names to date. And it is a tool where you can enter in the code, Python version and function call, and it will show you the disassembled bytecode. Here we've got the dynamic version of the paths function and we can you know, highlight lines and see the bytecode on the side. So let's take a look at one of the simpler lines here we are on 4x in range w. So the very first thing it does is actually load global. And you can click through and see that load global loads the global named blah onto the stack. Okay, so it's loading the global named range onto the stack. Then there's load fast, which pushes a reference to a local variable onto the stack. So that's loading w onto the stack. Then there's call function, which calls whatever is on the stack. So it's going to call range w. That returns an iterable, so get iter will turn that into an iterator. And then it's going to iterate through that iterator using for iter. And then it stores the top of the stack into this X here. You can see how this one line of Python code corresponds to one, two, three, four, five, six opcodes. Now this was in Python 3.10. As I mentioned, bytecode does change for version. So let's go to 3.11. 
and see how it changes. In 3.11, there is something called the adaptive interpreter. And this is something that comes from the faster C Python team. And this adaptive interpreter can optimize calls. And it has actually introduced a lot of new opcodes. And these ones change a lot per version. So let me enable the adaptive interpreter and assemble. And this shows us what it looks like with that enabled, which is what's usually enabled. This time what we see is that it pre-calls a built-in class. So this is a new a new opcode and it's so new, it's not even in the documentation. So I actually link to the C code, but as I was saying, this stuff is changing all the time because you know the Python team is trying to come up with new ways to make our Python faster. And you can see lots of differences between the adaptive interpreter and not adaptive. Lots of opcodes have changed. Uh, lots of them to get way more specific as well when they can. I love to do this disassembly because it feels like I'm going behind the scenes of CPython, you know, looking inside the matrix. Many of the tools that I showed were open source projects that I maintain, like Recursion Visualizer, Faded Parsons Problems, and Dis This. And I would love your pull requests to help us make more portraits of Python programs so that we can all learn about Python in many different ways. Thank you.